You're listening to Talking Law, the podcast where business owners just like you discover how to avoid legal landmines and build value using smart legal tips. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here and welcome back to Talking Law, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. In this episode of Talking Law, we look at the possible changes to franking credits, negative gearing and the taxing of trusts, and we discuss how this might impact businesses in Australia and their owners. So buckle in, here we go. Now, today we have back on the show Ed Chan of Chan & Naylor. Ed is a regular keynote speaker in many property seminars around Australia and is recognised as one of Australia's foremost authorities on tax and property, as well as co-authoring four best-selling books are along a range of topics and industries, all the way from how to reduce your tax, how to create wealth for life through property investing, and how to run a successful small business called From Small to Great. In this particular episode, I talked to Ed about the possible changes to franking credits, negative gearing, and the taxing of trusts. And we look at what this might mean and how this might impact businesses in Australia and their owners. So if you're interested in this topic, buckle in, here we go. All right, Ed, welcome back on Talking Law. Thank you so much for coming back in to chat to us today. Hi, Joanna. Thanks for having me back. It was nice to uh, come back. It's my absolute pleasure, Ed. Um, Look, our discussion in our last episode was just fabulous. And today, I guess we're switching gear a little bit. In the last episode, we were talking about some really fundamental concepts in relation to growing a business uh, past critical mass, I guess. Uh, Today, we're talking a little bit more practically in relation to some direct changes that might be on our doorstep at the moment in relation to the proposals from the Labor Party going into the election in May relating to dealing with franking credits and negative gearing. We have a lot of our clients, a bit of murmurs around, what does this mean to us? What should we do with it? So I thought we should bring in the experts so that you can talk a little bit to us about what these changes are and what impact they might have. So let's start with what changes are being suggested at the moment and what do you think they might look like if they actually came into force? Okay, so the first one was uh, Labor's proposing to change the laws around franking credits with frank dividends. And just to explain, uh, just so that we can get some context around this, uh, what a company... You can invest your money into a, a company as a shareholder and then they make profits and... When they make profits, they pay tax on it, and you know the tax rate's thirty percent. Say, just say it's thirty percent. Then they pay you a dividend. They either pay you a dividend, either a frank dividend or an unfrank dividend. A frank dividend is uh, has tax attached to it because they paid tax on your behalf, or they've taken tax out of your profits, and uh, then they've given you the the rest. So if it's a thousand dollars, they they would have sent off. Three hundred dollars, say thirty percent, to the tax department. They give you seven hundred dollars. Now, if it's a thousand dollar unfrank dividend, then they pay you the full thousand dollars. And if you lodge your tax return, you've got to gross that up, and you've got to declare not seven hundred dollars, you've got to declare a thousand dollars. And depending on where your personal tax rate is, uh, you have to either you know do pay top up tax if your personal tax rate's more than that. If it's forty seven percent, you have to do do a top up of 17%. And if your tax rate's 20%, then they'll give you a 10% refund back because you, they've taken too much tax out of your pay. Now, that's been around for 30 years. And what the Labor government's proposing is that uh, what well, the rhetoric is um, you shouldn't get a refund if you're not paying any tax. And I, I think the, 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 there is a fundamental, a fundamental sort of disagreement around this point because uh, our shadow treasurer, Chris Bowen, has come out and said that, you know, if you're not uh, paying tax, then you shouldn't get a refund. And if we drill into the definition of having paid tax, then effectively you have to pay tax because the shareholders own the company 
and the shareholders are the ones that are entitled to the profit. Now, they've created a company structure in the spirit of trying to uh, have the business run in an orderly fashion. But the bottom line is if they wound the company up, sold off all its assets, paid off its liabilities, the cash that's left over gets returned back to the shareholders. So effectively, you know, the profits belong to the shareholders. Now, uh, you know, the, the company directors who run the business may determine that, you know, they'll only pay out 50% of the profits or they may pay out 80% of the profits, but that, that's, their, at, that's at their discretion to determine. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it, it does belong to the shareholders. And if the, sh- if the company has sent off too much tax, then they're entitled to get it back. So, and, and that applies to all sorts of different um, different things. So, if they withheld too much withholding tax, um, then they've got to refund it back to you. Um, but Labor's suggesting that you know you actually didn't pay any tax, but you did. So, the laws will affect mainly, as I see it, mainly low income earners. And the reason why it will affect low-income earners is the only reason why you get a refund is if your tax rate is less than the company tax rate. And most people whose tax rates are under the company tax rates are low-income earners. Now, the the high-income earners won't get affected because, you know, they'll have to pay top-up tax anyway. And the other people that get affected is super fund, superannuation funds, where it's in pension mode, where the... Uh, Superfund is not paying any income tax uh, when, because uh, their tax rate is zero and the company's withheld 30% tax, then if they refund that money back to the Superfund, is on zero tax. So they're going to lose all their, their credits as well. So it, effectively what the Labor government is saying is that if you're on a low tax bracket, they're going to force those people to pay a 30% tax bracket because they're going to miss out on the refund. So they're actually paying, forcing them to pay a higher rate of tax than they actually are on. And I think that's really unfair. And how do you think this will, I I mean, I guess it affects business owners to the extent that they're individuals as well and, and they um, have shareholdings as individuals or however they have it structured. Do you see any impacts that this might have on businesses in Australia as well, the businesses themselves? Yes, because, you know, when they pay themselves uh, dividends out of their own companies, they're going to get affected in the same way. We we haven't seen the full legislation yet, but based on what uh, Chris Bowen has said, he hasn't differentiated between, you know, public companies and private companies. He's just said that, you know, everyone won't get, you know, won't get the franking credit back if you haven't paid tax. So it's going to affect, and especially self-managed super funds will really get affected big time. And uh, many, many small businesses have self-managed superannuation funds and, they, and they're running their own super funds. And I guess just to make it abundantly clear to our listener, I guess you're saying the super funds in particular are impacted because they're at a tax rate of 15%. So they're the ones who are losing the benefit of this difference between the 15 and the 30% or, or 29% yes. or whatever the case may be. Yes, correct. And also when the super funds are in pension mode, they don't pay any tax. So they get the full right, 30% course. credit back. Yes. Yes. They're going to get big, hit big time. And the, the unfairness of it is that they've exempted uh, industry funds like union funds from this law. So they've said that the union, union funds are exempt from all this. They're just going to hit self-managed super funds and retail funds wow. that are outside the unions. So, you know, you go figure that out. Um, Oh, that's incredible. I, I hadn't heard that bit. So if someone holds a superannuation account in an industry super fund, they, they're they exempt from um, having to pay the top up between the 15 and the 30%. Or, sorry, in, sorry, they no, get they, that. they get their franking credits back, yes. Right. But, the, yes. but retail funds and SMSFs don't get they that. They lose it, yes. Back. So there, there's this Correct. different regime between based simply on where your superannuation is held. Correct, and who's managing it. So they've gone from taxing the entity to, to taxing the person who's the, or the organisation that's running the super fund because a lot of these industry funds are managed by, you know, 50% of them are managed by unions. 
So that it's as though they're trying to push everyone into these industry funds and you know to uh, close down all the the self managed and the, the the retail funds. Right. Um, wow. From the way that they're trying to set it up. Yes. So I can certainly see that this then can impact businesses because, as you say, I think there's a large proportion of businesses in Australia, small businesses in, in Australia, SMEs that have their, uh, you know, an SMSF running on the side. So to hold their super, so obviously in this way, it becomes very applicable to them. Yes, and also a lot of small business people have their factories or their offices or their warehouses in their super funds. So that, you know, it's, I mean, it's held through, it's some, either through a unit trust or it's a joint venture or whatever the structure is, it, they, a lot of them have their businesses in self-managed super funds. Oh, sorry, business, their business premises in self-managed superannuation funds. And that's going to affect them if they lose their, you know, the, you know, all, all these rules that are coming through will, will affect them as well around negative gearing and, and so forth. Well, I'm glad you raised negative gearing because I guess that's the the next element that I just wanted to have a quick chat about. Maybe once again, if you can just talk about what the changes are that are being suggested in relation to negative gearing and does this impact businesses in Australia, I guess is my next question. (laughs) Well, a lot of small businesses are interested in, you know, they make their money out of their business and they invest it in the property. And the the changes are, and I'll just cover negative gearing so so we get context to the next the next bit. Negative gearing is where someone effectively loses money on an investment in the hope that you know the capital gain that comes out of it will make money for them, so that the losses, the cumulative losses, is less than the the capital gain. And uh, the ATO accepts that. Uh, and allows them to claim the negative gearing because when they sell the property and when they make a capital gain, they'll have to pay tax on it. So the taxman will get his money back. It allows people to claim the, the losses to help with their you know, tax because the, the, the tax laws at the moment, it's not, it's not isolated to property. I mean, if you run a business and your losses, your expenses are more than your income, you know, you're entitled to claim those losses. And uh, if you you know, borrowed some money and you went and bought some shares with it, you can negatively gear into shares as well. But they've just targeted property. So lots of people borrow money to buy into a property and the government is, well, the Labor government is targeting just property, they're not uh, targeted um, shares, uh, negative gearing into shares. So the proposed changes will be that they'll grandfather the properties that are negatively geared already. So if you've already bought a property and it's negatively geared, then you will retain that. But any new properties going forward, um, you won't be able to claim it if it's new. Uh, sorry, if it's new, you can. Sorry, that's, I just got that mixed up. If it's Only if it's brand new can you claim it. But as soon as you sell it into the second-hand market, then you lose the negative gearing. So the buyer of that new, uh, that, that second-hand property will miss out on the negative gearing. Only the person who's invested for the first time into that new property will get it. So, you know, if you bought a new property and, you know, you wanted to sell it and there's not as many people wanting to buy it because they're going to lose the negative gearing, so it's going to affect the, the property market. So, that, so that's a gist of what the Labor government is trying to bring in. The, the, prob- the, the argument is that um, the government is giving away, well, people are claiming negative gearing and it's, it comes to the tune of about $14 billion a year in uh, claims and if you average it at about a 30% tax bracket it's about a $4 billion loss to the government so the Labor government saying well you know we're losing $4 billion if we uh, get rid of it we'll save $4 billion but they're not looking at the big picture because there's a the private sector well, firstly, the, there's only there's about 1.7 million property investors in Australia, and 97% of them only own one property, and uh, the other 3% own more than one property. And the people that generally own these properties are, you know, just the the the, the average mum and dad person out there. You know, the nurse or the um, a, a bookkeeper or the you know, just mum and dad people, and they're trying to get ahead so that they don't have to rely on the old old age, uh, the government old age pension. 
So effectively, they're saving the government a lot of money later on because they're trying to be self-funded. And, uh, and they're not doing anything in a big advantaged way because the laws at the moment says if you lose money on a investment, you can actually claim the losses. So there's, there's nothing fundamentally different to uh, what they're doing to, to, to everybody else. The, 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 of course, the, the problem is that um, there's a huge demand for real estate and the, they provide, private property investors provide around 96% of housing in Australia, whereas the government only provides around 4%. Now, if they've got real need of gearing, the government will have to you know, come up with the money to provide the supply that the private sector has been providing. And the so-called $4 billion losses, which is not a loss because when they sell the property, they'll tax the taxpayer and they'll get the money back. It's just a temporary cash flow thing you know if people pulled out of property and and i'm going to pull out of property if they if they bring this law in there's just no more incentive for me um, and and you know the land tax laws are really horrendous as well so you're getting hit all over the place and you think well why should i put my money in the property i'll just go into you know shares there's less sort of taxes and uh, and, and penalties um so and, and of course the property market it constitutes around uh, 18% of our economy. You know, we, we talk about mining. You know, mining, we, we talk about how big mining was and all that, but it's only 8% of our economy. Property is 18%. And the domino and the knock-on effect, it's a, it's a, it's like a big furnace to our economy. And, and we've got to, you know, keep stoking that, that, uh, that fire to keep the, the, the economy growing. We need to, Get the GDP to about three percent, you know, to keep unemployment below five percent. If we can't keep GDP at three percent, then uh, and our unemployment rate starts to rise, then you know that that puts us into recession, uh, recession territory, and um, and the government is, uh, you know, we've got about two hundred and forty thousand people, of migrants coming into this country, and that adds around one to one and a half percent to our GDP. So that helps a lot, but but the flip side to it is that when people come in, you've got to provide housing to them. But the housing that's provided is by pro- property investors that then stokes the economy. So it's a, you know, it, it's a really good way to keep the the economic fires moving forward. But Labor is going to douse water on all that, and uh, and it's going to. I don't, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but Paul Keating um, in the eighties. Yeah, he uh, gave it a go. Uh, stop, <laughs> yeah, and, and, well, he gave it a go. Stick around for long. Yes, and then, <laughs> yes, and then I think it was just nine months, and he had to bring it back in because yeah. the, you know, the the housing waiting list just went through the roof um, because people just pulled out. And so. And what impact, I mean, do you see, obviously this relates to individuals more than business, but do you see any knock-on effect to businesses, particularly small businesses in Australia from um, uh, from the negative gearing uh, potential changes? Uh, well, it's going to, like, I'm a businessman, I own a business, I won't be buying properties if uh, if this rule came came through. And, um, okay, I'm only one business, business person, but you know, a lot of business men and women think the way I do. We like to make our money from our businesses and we invest it into property. And if there's no, if I can't claim my negative gearing, you know, and I've got to pay all these horrendous land tax, what incentive is there to, uh, to invest in the property? I'll put my money somewhere else. Uh, and, and I think that that will have a knock-on effect. You know, if I feel this way, I'm sure other people would feel this way as well. Mm. And so is there anything that I guess businesses can do or individuals who, you know, are running businesses, are part of businesses <laughs> can do? Obviously, the negative gearing relates to individuals, but the franking credit side, you know, may relate to business changes that businesses can make? Is there anything that businesses can do to prepare in advance, I guess I'm asking? Well, the negative gearing does affect businesses because businesses do buy into property, not just individuals. So, you know, I I buy into businesses. Sorry, I buy into property. So businesses do buy into property and it will affect businesses. So I, I don't buy the properties in my own name. I buy it through my my businesses and you know i'm adding supply to the country demand for you know for tenants the tenants are 
you know, if you don't increase the supply to them, their rents will just go up. So I think it will affect businesses um, from that perspective. They'll just put their money somewhere else. They're also, I know this is a different topic, but they're also talking about taxing family trusts. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of businesses in family trusts. Yeah. So they're going to tax family trusts as well. And that's that hasn't had a lot of um, airplay, um, but, you know, but it's there. If you look at their legislation, it's there. So that's another sort of uh, difficult point because, you know, these laws that were set up, uh, including the superannuation laws, were set up many years ago and people have structured their lives around these laws and they're just going to go and change it. In relation to the the potential changes you're talking about to um, the taxing of trusts, like you know, obviously, I, I think each of these areas we're talking about here are, you know, potentially, if they came into play, would be fundamental changes. The, the taxing of trusts, once again, will be an absolutely fundamental change, you know, and, and potentially impact structuring and structuring approaches from the income distribution side, obviously trusts still offer uh, the, the asset protection side, which wouldn't be impacted by these changes. But are accountants, you know, what's happening in the industry at the moment? Are accountants sort of getting together and trying to work out an action plan if this comes into play or is it really just at the moment a um, watch and wait environment to see what actually happens? Well, it's really a watch and wait because if Labor does get in, it just depends on the, the number of seats they win. If they win a majority, then they could push these things through without needing you know any support from the independents or from Liberal, but if it's a very close election and they and they only just scrape in, then they've still got to convince the Senate. Uh, sorry, they've still got, still got to convince the independents to support them, and then there'll be a lot of rallying. There'll be a lot of media. There's a lot of you know negativity towards it. I, I believe because um, as I read the newspaper and I, I read things, you know, there's there's a groundswell happening. And if you look at the polls recently, Liberals have uh, the coalition who have starting to make some grounds on the Labor, they might reduce the number of seats they'll win and they won't have a majority, then uh, they may not be able to push these things through through the, through the Senate. Uh, mm. So we can only hope. But <laughs> at the moment, it's probably a little bit a bit early, you but know, it's but good looking at the poll. In advance, I guess, you know, what, what some of the potential changes that are there on the horizon, you know, are and, and how it might impact all of us as individuals as well as, as business owners. Certainly, you know, trusts are a uh, favoured structure for many a business. So, um, certainly that would be, I think, a change that would really be of interest to most businesses throughout Australia. All right, Ed. Look, I just want to say a very big thank you for coming on Talking Law today, just to talk to us a little bit about what those proposals are and and what they would potentially look like in terms of the impact on um, us if they were to come into play. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure. And if um, if people want to find out more about this topic or perhaps plan in advance, how can they contact one of your accountants at Chan and Nail It? Well, we've got uh, 12 offices around Australia. And if you just go into the Chan and Nail It website, you can then know where those offices are and, um, you know, there's contact details there. Brilliant. And we'll also link through to that from our show notes. So if you are running on the beach or uh, on your commute into work at the moment, have no fear. You'll find uh, links in our show notes uh, so you don't have to write it all down now. Well, Ed, I just want to say a massive thank you for coming on to our show. We'll have to definitely have you back again another day to talk more about the business environment that we're all in. Thank you, Ed. All right. Well, thanks for having us. It was great. Well, that's it for our discussion with Ed Chan today on the topic of how these possible changes to franking credits, negative gearing and the taxing of trusts might impact businesses in Australia and their owners. 
Now, if you'd like more information about this topic, or you'd like to download a transcript of this podcast episode, if you'd like to read it in more detail, just head over to talkinglaw.com.au. There you'll also find details of how to contact Chan and Naylor or Ed, or how to contact our lawyers at Aspect Legal if you are growing a business and you want some assistance with building the foundations as you grow. Now, if you enjoyed what you heard today, please pop over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player and press subscribe so you get these episodes of Talking Law delivered straight to your phone. And that's it. Thanks again for listening in. You have been listening to Joanna Oki and Talking Law, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. See you next time. Are you looking for a top quality legal team to assist you in your organisation? Aspect Legal is an innovative commercial legal practice that specialises in providing fast and professional services for their clients. If you'd like to chat about how we might be able to assist you, simply head over to our website at aspectlegal.com.au to book in a time for a free discussion with one of our lawyers. Thanks for listening to Talking Law. Tune in next time for more smart legal tips and tricks to keep you clear of those legal landmines. If you want to get a download of today's show notes, head over to talkinglaw.com.au. Are you looking for a top quality legal team to assist you in your organisation? Aspect Legal is an innovative commercial legal practice that specialises in providing fast and professional services for their clients. If you'd like to chat about how we might be able to assist you, simply head over to our website at aspectlegal.com.au to book in a time for a free discussion with one of our lawyers.